If you've known me for long, or you're a regular viewer of this channel, you probably know that, when I was younger, I wanted nothing more than to be the captain of a ship. I first became interested in ships, like so many other people before and after me, by learning about Titanic. From there, it did not take long to figure out that Titanic was not a cruise ship, but rather an ocean liner. And from there, it did not take long for me to realize that ocean liners, for the most part, were a thing of the past, largely due to the rise of commercial aviation. There is something especially compelling to me about ocean liners. Maybe it's that they're large, fast, and powerful, but I think that it has more to do with the fact that they serve, or served, an important and necessary task, transportation across oceans. So naturally, I was a little disheartened to realize that I would never become the captain of an ocean liner, like the glorified Captain Edward J. Smith in the movie Titanic. And if you're here to learn about how you can become the captain of an ocean liner, I'm sorry to be the one to break it to you, but it's very unlikely that you'll be able to reach that goal. Not because I doubt your abilities or ambitions, but because there is, strictly speaking, only one proper ocean liner left in the world. And so I would instead gently push you in the direction of some other maritime or transportation career, of which there are many. So this video is not about how to become an ocean liner captain in 2021, but rather how to become an ocean liner captain in 1921, for example. In other words, this video is not intended to provide advice, unless you have a time machine, but to give you a glimpse into the career path of an ambitious young lad drawn to the sea. For most of the ocean liner era, a ship's officer would have gotten his start on a sailing ship. Commercial sailing ships were viable well into the 1900s. So these sailing ships needed to be crewed by someone, ideally strong, nimble, and motivated young men, such as aspiring merchant marine officers. A future officer would likely go to sea at a young age a very young age from our perspective today. Edward J. Smith, future captain of Titanic, went to sea at the age of 17. Arthur Rostron, captain of the ship which rescued Titanic survivors, went to sea at age 16. Charles H. Lightoller, second officer of Titanic, went to sea at age 13. These boys would begin their careers as apprentices. It would be some time before they would even earn the lowly title of sailor. For the time being, their job was to gain enough experience so as to become useful and they had a lot to learn. One of the first things they would learn is how difficult the next several years of their life would be. As Arthur Rostron put it in his autobiography, quote, I was to find out that sailing ships meant hard work, sometimes bullying by more or less ignorant officers, great risks, and poor food. Every sort of discomfort that one can conjure to the imagination. The clippers of the late 19th century were demanding in every way imaginable. They were designed to earn profits, and speed was the name of the game for clippers. As such, the hull of a clipper was long and narrow and her masts exceedingly tall to accommodate the tens of thousands of square feet of canvas needed to drive the ship to her maximum. An apprentice could not afford any fear of heights or he would quickly find his career dead in the water before it even began. The best clippers in the best conditions, or worse conditions depending on how you look at it, achieved speeds of up to 18 knots. For those of you who sail, you know that this is a remarkable speed for a vessel under sail, and that a speed like that would feel much faster for a man on deck than it sounds to a landlubber. And the crew had to work for this type of speed. Clipper captains were notorious for their devotion to speed at all costs. Every stitch of canvas was fully utilized, unless the safety of the ship was at peril, and sometimes even then. It was a dedication inspired by profit but also by pride, as clipper captains lived and died by their reputations, and the best of them were very nearly of celebrity status. All of this meant that the sailors were laboring hard and risking their lives while on deck or aloft in the rigging, but also that, when allowed to rest below deck, the rest was difficult to acquire. All the sounds and movements of the ship remained, and chances are, you would be wet, because once you get wet at sea, there's really no drying off, and eventually, even the blankets on your bunk would become damp at best. And despite the conditions, rats and cockroaches somehow survived on the ship, to serve as another source of discomfort for her crew. With any luck, you wouldn't go to bunk hungry, but that was anything but a guarantee. It was standard practice for apprentices and sailors alike to sneak food beyond their rations just to get by. Most of the food was about as unappetizing as it came, although in some circumstances, it probably didn't matter much. And it could be days without a single hot meal. A single voyage could last upwards of a year, with the only time on land being when the ship was in port to trade cargo. Chances were that a voyage would take a young apprentice around Cape Horn at least once. It's a waterway infamous for its foul weather and frigid temperatures. 
It was sometimes said that an apprentice wasn't truly a sailor until he had rounded Cape Horn three or four times and contended with those gnarly graybeards, as the rolling white-capped waves of those waters were called. A young sailor's quality of life while getting experience at sea depended largely on the crew he was surrounded by, and most importantly, the abilities and character of the skipper, and they often were characters. There is one infamous clipper captain named Robert H. Waterman, who is publicly known better by the name Bully Waterman. He was a record-setting skipper, having driven his clipper ship, Sea Witch, from Hong Kong to New York in just over 74 days. But he put the lives of his crew at risk in order to make these remarkable times, and lost many of them in the process, including nine on a single voyage, four of whom fell from the masts and into the sea, and the other five succumbing to injuries inflicted either from accidents or abuse. Interestingly, Charles Lightoller writes in his memoirs about a captain he sailed under who went by the similar name, Bully Waters. Although he met Bully Waters on a steam packet rather than a clipper, Lightoller notes that the captain had a way of inflicting psychological trauma on his crew by pushing them just to the brink before letting up. No doubt, many sea captains were sadistic for one reason or another, and made the lives of their crew nightmarish, but this was one of the many obstacles for aspiring merchant marine officers. Some young seamen had it a little bit easier by working on a packet ship, for example, rather than a clipper. A packet ship being one which, for economic reasons, carried much less sail and were not driven nearly as hard. The reality is that most trades did not require the hard-earned speed of a clipper ship, and market forces therefore ensured that it was uneconomical for clippers to be used in these trades, primarily the initial building costs and the cost of the huge crew they required. Packet ships operated on a predetermined schedule and carried less urgent cargoes, including passengers. But aside from being driven hard to the maximum speed, the sailors of packets endured all the hardships of their counterparts on the clippers, including often extreme abuse from the captain. While many of these sailors were from respectable backgrounds and were in fact aspiring officers themselves, many of the sailors were plucked up off the streets of port cities and put to work aboard ship. As such, they were, as a group, viewed with disdain by many a packet captain. On packet ships where even the paying passengers were not treated particularly well, the lowly and easily replaceable sailors were treated as practically subhuman. Physical punishment was common, due either to the captain's sadistic tendencies or his belief that such treatment was a necessity when driving a ship at speed with the likes of a crew of degenerates. I should clarify that even though packet ships were not built like clippers and were therefore slower, they were still driven to their own, albeit lower, maximum speed. The toxic shipboard culture was exacerbated greatly by the socio-economic standing of a packet captain. In the days of sailing packets, the captains were among the wealthy elite and earned a percentage of the revenues from a voyage. While the captain earned a different percentage rate from passengers, cargo, and mail, their earnings were extremely high overall. A packet captain could expect to earn something like $20,000 annually, an immense amount of money in those days. For comparison, even the senior captain of a Premier Express liner in the future would never come close to earning this type of money. And in a world more divided by class than today, the captain, a wealthy capitalist with godlike authority over his ship, was unlikely to treat his sailors with much or any respect, especially when those sailors, from his perspective, were serving as obstacles to his payday. Not every sailor was ambitious enough to want to rise through the ranks and become an officer, but those who did had to jump through more hoops than just simply gaining experience at sea. Each country had its own regulatory requirements, but I will focus on the British process here. There were a series of steps along the way to obtaining a master's certificate, the necessary certification to command one's own ship. Looked at from a high level, the process was essentially a cycle of accumulating enough time at sea, studying the academic material including mathematics and navigation, sitting for an examination, and then returning to sea to acquire more experience. And although the academics and examinations might sound like a bureaucratic process, it did serve as a serious obstacle and filter, and many who sat for those exams did fail them. Only the best and the brightest passed all of the exams without ever failing. The time frame was generally something like this. Three or four years as an apprentice before sitting for the second mate exam. Then back to sea for another year or two, learning as much as you can about seamanship and now leadership. After that, sit for the exam for the mate's certificate. Then another year or two at sea, before finally sitting for the exam to get your master's ticket. The sea time requirements were unbudging though, and sometimes placed unnecessary burden on ascending officers. 
Arthur Rostron, who was famous for his role as captain on the Cunard Line's Carpathia when he rescued the survivors from the Titanic, returned from one voyage as first mate, six weeks short of the experience requirement, to sit for the exam for his master's certificate, a fairly negligible amount of time in the grand scheme of things. He may well have had to sign on to another long voyage to meet this requirement had he not found the grimy little steamer named River Avon, which allowed him to acquire the last of his time, get paid, and finally sit for the master certificate. Earning a master certificate, though, does not entitle one to command a ship. In practice, one might command a sailing ship for a period of time only to end up as the third officer, for example, on a steamship. The goal for many aspiring officers was to join a prestigious company in any capacity and work their way up the ladder from there. When Charles Lightoller joined the White Star Line as the fourth officer aboard the Medic, he was exceptionally happy with himself for having reached the heights of the White Star Line, despite being five positions removed from being the master of even the relatively small Medic. And he was right to be proud of himself. He would become the second officer of one of White Star's premier Atlantic liners, the Oceanic, then the first officer on the older Majestic, and then finally back to Oceanic as the first officer. All of this over the course of just 10 years. Before long, he was supposed to be the first officer on the grandest ship in the world, RMS Titanic. His personal career trajectory was obstructed by his involvement in the sinking of Titanic, though. He was on his way up, but very likely due to the black mark against him as a result of the sinking of Titanic, his merchant surface career more or less ended here. This is a demonstration of the fact that this industry, like many others, is not a perfect meritocracy. Others were luckier though. Arthur Rostron was appointed his first command in 1907. His ship would be the 3000 gross register ton Brescia. Rostron would go on to the fame for his role in the Titanic saga, but was also destined to become the Commodore of the Cunard Line, the absolute pinnacle of an ambitious man's career in the merchant service in the 20th century. Since Rostron was the epitome of a successful ocean liner captain, I will leave you with his words of advice to any young man who wanted to follow in his footsteps. Is he prepared to work with no eye on the clock? And has he the patience enough to wait the opportunity to gain promotion? If so, he'll have a good, healthy life, be of some real service to the world, and, even though he may not land one of the coveted appointments, such as command of a big liner, he will get his ship, live well, and, in age, can find himself with sufficient competence. He also provided some more specific advice. For example, he wrote that one would be given a command sooner if they worked on cargo ships. In any case, though, he stressed the importance of sticking to a single company if possible, as it would greatly accelerate, or at least not inhibit, one's career to demonstrate loyalty and commitment. By the time Captain Rostron wrote his autobiography, he knew that most aspiring officers would not start their careers on sailing ships, not even at the very beginning. That would have made life much easier, although it would mean fewer stories to tell after retiring to a rocking chair. Unfortunately though, by the time a young man at this time would have been able to climb up through the hierarchy, the height of the ocean liner era would be drawing to a close, and the joys of the golden age of the ocean liner era would be diminished for those who followed in Rostron's footsteps. And now you know how one would go about becoming the captain of an ocean liner. In an upcoming video, I will discuss what the role of an ocean liner captain looked like, and what it took to be successful in that career and lifestyle. So stay tuned. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new about maritime history today. If you enjoyed this video and want to support my work, you can join the Great Big Move on Patreon. The support of my audience allows me to dedicate more of my time to making videos like this one, and my supporters on Patreon get extra content and perks as a special thanks.